Hi everyone, and welcome to Proving Grounds. So I'd like to I'd like to start by thanking our sponsors, uh, Versprite, Vertivity, Tenable, Amazon, and Source of Knowledge. Please go and, and visit them out in the chill out area. So our next talk is on how to get and maintain your compliance without ticking everyone off by Rob Carson, Director of Security at Sharewell. He loves building and improving immature security programs, and he looks really dapper in a purple suit. <laughs> um, so what? <laughs> building. Building. No, it's just <laughs> improving. I have a typewriter. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Before we get started, I just want to say the track's being recorded. So at at the end, when we do questions, I'm going to be running the mic around. Let's give Rob a warm welcome. All right. Thank you guys. All right, so how do we get and maintain compliance without pissing everybody off? So one, realizing that, hey, it's never going to happen. They're going to have perfect compliance. So let's just move on past that. You know, talk about some of the challenges that professionals face, uh, basically being compliant but not necessarily fully secure, right? And then how creativity and outreach get the job done, who to engage with and how to engage with different business units. And then uh, still being able to call yourself a, a true security professional and not just be like, it's a big uh, Swiss cheese, right? Everyone hear me okay? All right. So my background, I'm director of uh, security at Sherwell Software. Uh, prior lives as well, I've done uh, ISO 27001 flights. Uh, I've had a couple zero flying audits, also done PCI, HIPAA. Uh, going through Fed ramp right now, so it's a whole new adventure with missing steroids. And uh, used to be a Marine Corps infantry officer. All right, so initial implementation. So this is a lot what it feels like if you're kicking off, you know, an ISO compliance program, PCI, or anything like that. And one thing to recognize is that just as these young Marines here graduating, from, you know, going through boot camp, right? You graduate from boot camp, you're a infantryman. You're a provisional rifle infantryman. You go to special on school, follow on schools, things like that. You're not necessarily a MARSOC operator or some sort of special forces ninja. So understanding that, hey, just because you got you passed your first audit does not mean you're going to be some, you know, all-star ninja. All right. So that's how it goes. So how do you do it? One. <laughs> and uh, I got my security architect in here, and uh, that's a lot of us like. Two, just try to boil the whole ocean. I've been guilty of this for sure. Uh, a lot of times you wind up, you know, I try to boil the whole ocean, I wind up, you know, just doing North Atlantic, and that still is why I don't hear anymore. But we'll get there. So what should you consider as you're kicking off the program? So there's an impacting factor. So depending on the size of your organization, you're gonna have different things. So personnel changes, so people are gonna come and go. You're gonna have potentially 24 seven support staff, depending on what kind of uh, company you run. Explosive growth could be a big thing. That's a that's a definitely a huge challenge is how do you, as you're going down the road, trying to do your program, also change the tires while you're going down the road. Resistance to change, because change is hard. You know, you sometimes get out for free hugs sometimes, it feels like. Like it's, you know, pe people are used to doing things a certain way. Why can't I do it this way? You know, those kind of things. Like how do you, you know, get to overcome those challenges? Um, and ability to execute. That's another big piece too is that you know, one of the things is, is he, nobody has an unlimited budget, nobody has an unlimited time. So you have to stay focused on what's the most important part and understanding some things you're gonna have to improve later on. And then external, so you have changes in statutory regulations, uh, increasing customer requirements. And let's face it, uh, I don't know how you guys feel, but I get these things from customers all the time. Why aren't you NERC? Why don't you have SOC 2? Why don't you have this? Why don't you have that? Because we'd be auditing hell all year long if that's what we did. We just, you know, picked up every single certification there was. And then we also have new vulnerabilities, you know. The IT guys have it easier sometimes because let's face it, they have a new uh, version of Windows every few years. We have a new vulnerability every day. So who here has ever felt that someone in their company might feel like this? Yeah. So, and that's one of the things, one of my favorite frameworks is ISO because it demands uh, continuous improvement. And that's one of the best things about it. So like, you're compliant, but you still have to continue to improve it. So you don't get to just stick with 
Well, we passed it. We're good. Let's just stay the way we are. So where do we start? Right? So the first thing is to start with people. So who are the people, not only on your core team, but also who are the different, uh, different business units, the stakeholders, who are going to be working with to implement this? Because it's not just going to be you. You're going to have people from IT. Depending on your scope, it might be professional services. It might be uh, people who, uh, if you're an MSSP, people who handle the customer data, things like that. You're going to be having to deal with different stakeholders. So figuring out who they are and finding those people that can, can preach the security gospel and those that are going to be a big pain in your ass. Figure out who they are and start working around, working with them. And then process, right? So the first, one of the most important things is to figure out what your processes are. So instead of writing these beautiful, you know, 50 page SOPs of a process that you don't even come close to following, write down what you actually do, okay? Start there. If you can just make sure that everybody's doing what they say they actually do, that's actually a great start in the right direction. Because at that point, you can start wrapping technology around it to either enforce that process or uh, you know, control it in different ways. And then let's talk about one of the pieces to start with processes too. So one of the mistakes I've made is that I have done, you know, I'll start rolling out an HR security SOP before I even have some of the core processes I need to have in place first. So what are those core processes? You need to have, you know, your committee procedures. How are you going to meet? How are you going to write your documents? Your control records, control, rec control documents, SOPs. Your audit SOP, your training SOP. Some of those core SOPs, and maybe corrective action, preventive action, because if you roll out the other SOPs, how are you going to audit it to make sure it's working? How are you going to handle it if it breaks? You need to have some of the core infrastructure set up first before you start rolling out the, uh, the, the big network you know, operations SLP, things like that. If you don't have those things in, in place first, it's going to be very difficult to deal with those as those things need to mature and improve. So scope. Yeah. <laughs> know and define your scope and don't overcomplicate it. So what is your most critical assets? What, where, what are the things that drive revenue? That's probably going to be your scope. Or maybe it's IT operations because that touches everybody, but they don't necessarily have to feel it okay, as much. But picking your scope and understanding you know, what is the most important piece. So where I work, it's our customer data. At the end of the day, I, I feel really bad if our employee data got leaked out, but that's not going to stop revenue. I'll have employees to apologize to. So you know, figuring out what the real scope should be. And then those boundaries. <laughs> right? And those, yeah. <laughs> so keep it clean, keep it enforceable, turn them later in your app, right? What are those boundaries? What is the scope? So especially if you have a uh, you know, PCI, you have a CDE environment, you know, what are those actual boundaries of your perimeter? For FedRAMP, same kind of thing. You, know, you have to really understand what those boundaries are and understand how that data flows in and out. So maturity, all right? So one of the things to think about is that when you start off, this can take, you know, depending on the size of your organization, it can take a year it can take two years, depending on how big you are, right? But once you hit this managed state where you actually have, you know, at least they might be manual processes, but you have those in place, you're able to start really quickly accelerating and getting to that quantitatively managed spot. And that's where automation comes into play. All these awesome tools that they sell out there, that's great stuff. But if you don't have good, if you don't have a process, what do you automate? You know, figure out what you need to automate first. What is that process? How is this supposed to look? What are you going to control? So, maturing to the next phase. How do we go from a bunch of Iraqi army soldiers to the Marine Corps drill team? All right? So, that click pop, right? It's pretty sexy. Or you can be like that, which is what, you know, you probably start off when you get started, right? All right. <laughs> lessons learned. Anybody ever served in the military knows there's some lessons you learned in the gas chamber pretty quick. All right, so compliance fails. So, you know, organizations stopping once the policy is drafted. One of the things you have to recognize is that your procedures are going to change. Even if you wrote the most perfect procedure in the world, if your organization grows at 10% a year, 
it's probably going to have to change at least 10% just to keep up. All right. So understanding that you have to do that. So you know, one of the things I recommend is getting a good piece of SOP management software. I've used uh, Policy Tech in the past. It's like an API. I don't sell that thing or anything like that. That's not a plug. It just it, the thing works because it lets you make sure that you can you can control your you can push out your SOPs. Make sure you can get people to read them when they've changed. And one of the things I've seen at the last place I was at. Uh, they were tracking SOP approvals via email. Try approving that to an auditor. Like, that's going to suck. So think about those things. Those are some of the core things I would, you, know, you want to get in place if you can. Um, just because security technology is implemented, it's not protected, you get have hits with an any any rule. It doesn't do shit for you. But you're, you know, you're compliant. <laughs> um, poor configurations. You know, policies for the sake of policies. Uh, when I got to, to Sherwell, they had an eight-page password policy. I did, it was horrible. Like, I didn't argue. And this is what we do, right? So, cut it down to two paragraphs, put it in acceptable use, and move the heck on, right? Keep it as simple as you can. So, and that's one of the things, when I started, they had 50 SOP, 50 policies, three SOPs, okay? So, they had these policies that they are works of art. Should be frank. I mean, an eight-page password policy, that's pretty impressive. But at the end of the day, what good is it, right? No one knows how to follow it. So with all these policies, you got to make sure that you want SOPs. You want to make sure they know how they actually can follow the policy or the procedure that you're actually trying to enforce that control. You know, a lot most people will try to follow the procedure if it's clear. But if it doesn't say go here, send an email to this distro, you know, that's how you make sure you're actually able to make your procedures useful. Um, policy, you know, talk, talk about that. Policies don't make any damn sense. You know, one of the things I've struggled with is, uh, you know, we have, you know, you have rules like no BYOD, yet you can bring your phone, but you can't bring a tablet, right? Think about it, though, right? Your tablet's the same basic OS, right? So what's the point, right? So let's, you know, those are challenges I have, and I'm happy to talk afterwards about how you guys have tackled those ones as well. So compliance wins, yeah. It can actually not suck totally. All right. So baseline, baseline of your, of your security controls. So at the end of the day, when you start off, at least now you're actually looking at it from a holistic standpoint and not just looking at it from one spot. Now, where you improve is going to be dependent on your budget, your ability to execute, as well as what is um, what's really relevant to you. What's your data? You know, where do you really want to spend your effort? You know, does your physical security matter that much um, as long as they can't connect? Or where, where do you want to spend your time? You can't spend your time everywhere, so it helps you start to figure out where you can slowly and then incrementally increase different parts of your controls. Um, and they address a lot of people in process. So you can do a lot of free security with good people in process. You know, yeah. You know, for all the pen testers out there, oh, well, I can still do this and that and this. And I'm looking at a couple of guys that have hired a few times along the way, and they're like, well, I can still do whatever, but that's fine. But what's the people in process? What's, what's the process? Let's make sure you're following it, because then I can put those technical controls in place, right? So, but, and that covers a lot of it. You're still dealing with insider threats. I get it, but it's a starting point. You have to start somewhere, because you can't get that incremental progress if you don't start somewhere and just move, move from there. All right, mandating improvements, so that's why I love ISO. And mechanism for budget, so the way my risk assessment works, when I do a risk assessment, I do it off of the business process and the information assets it creates, right? I don't do an, a risk assessment on a server. Who gives a shit about the server? What we really care about is the data on that server, what business processes are critical to that server. And so when you're sitting down with the CFO, it's a whole lot easier to say, I need this to protect this business process, this line of revenue that drives this amount, this X amount, as opposed to, I need it because it's cool, you know? Like, why do you need this? You know, it's for this business process. That actually can, that resonates a lot better with an executive team than it will with, um, you know, just you get into the bits and bytes of, well, I need, a, I need an SS scanner and a follow scanner, I need all this stuff. Like, for what? Why? What are the business processes we're protecting? Why are we doing it? Because that's what we're, this isn't a non for profit. We're, we're doing this for one, you know, to maintain revenue, right? To make sure we protect that revenue, protect that data, so that our stuff's not out there. And then toolkit. So one of the things I use is the Cloud Security Alliance questionnaire. 
So when you get those uh, RFP questions from your customers and like somebody sends you one Excel sheet with 70 questions, the next guy sends you one with 20 questions, the next guy sends you one with 300, um, this is a way to streamline that. So this thing has 300, 300 questions and it will literally answer everything that customer is going to need to know. It's a very nice uh, compliance piece and sometimes it'll save you time as opposed to answering their questions. Answer them, answer them ahead of time. Um, I recommend it. And the nice part about it too is it actually has a mapping for every single framework out there. So it's got NERC, FERPA, everything out there. So you can actually say, okay, you're a, you're a SOC 2, you're an SA 16 shop, that's what you care about. Here's how my ISO controls map to this as opposed to, well, you don't have this, you don't have that. This is how you can get through those, uh, those, those issues when you're dealing with compliance people on the other side. Uh, Excel, you know, a lot of people start with Excel. It's fine. Get some good compliance management software out there if you, if you want to. Um, SOP management software, compliance veterans. So finding people out there that have been through this. How did you get through this? How were you able to uh, tackle this, this issue? How did you handle that control? Finding those guys out there. And then KRIs and KPIs. That's one of the big things that we use. So we use key risk indicators, and that can be my, you know, how many vulnerabilities of age past a certain date or, you know, whatever. But the key performance indicators would be more like, hey, uh, background checks versus employees hired every month. And that way I can make sure that my process, my SOP is actually performing as it's designed so I can check the performance of it as well as the risk. You know, those are things you want to think about. And then a poor man's threat feed. You know, so this is... Talk about you have your external ex external things. So this, this is a screenshot of what I use. So this is a tweet deck. It's free. But the nice part about it is I can plug stuff in that I think is interesting. I have like location, so I have spots, you know, look at different offices, see what's going on there. Uh, look at Sherwell, so I'll sit there and figure out, you know, I don't make sure no one's tweeting something heinous to see you doesn't get on a, a rampage about something crazy. You never know. You know, I mean that's happened to uh, I want to see in this area. Uh, and then, you know, looking at Brian Krebs, stuff like that, right? Hopefully he never calls me. Um, <laughs> so I'm leaving. All right, how to work with others. So be polite, be professional, have fun, feel like what you mean, right? You don't mess. All right, so sales it is all about them. So when you're engaging with sales and any of you do security training, hey, if you don't do your security training, how am I supposed to get on a call with a customer and tell them we're secure? Do you like selling? Let's make sure we do our security training. Marketing, they're arts and crafts masters, right? So if you deploy something like Titus, you know, it's a document classification thing, let them pick the font. Let them pick where it sits. Who cares? Let them pick that stuff. They're happy as long as you have a classification on it, right? You know, one of the things we did with control records, control docs, was supposed to write out this big thing and we're gonna use Courier New or New Times Roman 12, so we're going to follow whatever marketing is using, and that way marketing is happy because we're going to help enforce what they're doing. And at the same time, I'm not getting a battle over Trillium 11 or whatever font they want to use. It's just not a battle worth having, right? So make your compliance easy. You know, finance, it helps them control spending. So use them, you know, they can help you. So when they're buying new software, hey, make sure we check it beforehand. They're happy to delay a spend if they can, so that's an opportunity, right? Audit, be ready. This is what I wear in my audit. Why? Because it's fun, right? And I'm treating it as seriously as I can, right? So, you know, if you show up in a t-shirt and shorts, you know, it might look sloppy, right? You want to show like you've got your A game on. Take the fight to the enemy. So what I do, is I literally, a month before and about the weekend before, I go through every single control and walk through how I'm going to prove all of those and where that evidence is. And so when I'm sitting before the auditor, I'm taking them to it. So this way, at a minimum, I might wind up with uh, maybe a minor, maybe an information finding, as opposed, but I can show them some good evidence before they go with the bad evidence. You know? Because it, it may not be perfect, but at least you can show them that you are trying to follow the process. But thinking about how you're going to prove it, because the auditors smell blood. You know, they're sharks. So if you sit there and you're like, uh, it's all quiet, when they ask you a question, it doesn't look so well. So take the fight to them. Drive them. They're only there for so long. You know, finding a GRC process that doesn't suck, at least totally. You know, that's important to think about that. Figure out how you're going to handle those, those, those corrective actions, those preventative actions, things like that. 
So one of the challenges I think we all have from time to time is um, trying to understand what the control actually means. You know, from a security standpoint, well, I gotta have this. Well, it doesn't really say that. I mean, you read HIPAA, and you really have to have you know data rest encryption, or you just have to make sure the data is protected. You know, so there's things to think about. All right, risk assessment. Hey. You know, audit the processes, integrate with finance and legal. So ask yourself, what is the financial implications, legal implications of these processes failing? And assess the value of the data. So look at it from an information asset standpoint, more so than from a server or a USB stick, right? And that's it. Any questions? How you doing? Good. Um, what experience do you have with the risk management framework for federal information systems? So you're talking about NIST? Yeah, the NIST standards, yes. So it's basically planning to check back. It's, if you, sorry. Yeah, so that's a great question. and I could definitely follow up further off, offline, but um, the federal risk, risk management framework is not that much different than the old ISO risk management framework or the 31,000 series. It's Plan Do Check Act. It's it's a little bit different, but it's it's all basically the same. You know, it's assess the you know you make your uh, sorry. What is your you know what's your unmitigated risk and what's your mitigated risk? Being able to quantitatively prove that is one of the big pieces too. You know, so making sure you ask yourself repeatable questions as opposed to well I'm gonna give myself three points for because I've got proof point. Right or whatever. Well, that doesn't, you know, that's great, but that's not necessary. You want to make sure you have good questions on, on the back, on the downward side as well. Does that help? I guess what I'm asking is because I looked at that compared to the certain set of the ISO controls versus <laughs> their RMFs controls, and it looks like there's like a shit ton more of controls. I'm like, why is there so many? Oh, so you're talking about the actual NIST, the 300 controls they have. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a lot, a lot. Absolutely. It's more granular, and it's a little more specific, and it's definitely less, uh, you know, ISO says you need to meet the control, um, but it doesn't necessarily tell you how, whereas it gives you guidance, whereas with, with NIST, it's going to give you, especially like FedRAMP, which is basically NIST on steroids, it's going to be much more prescriptive on how you're going to meet that control. I don't know if that helps. Not, not really. <laughs> but thank you. All right. Any more questions? Well, let's All give right. them a round of, round of applause. Nice.